Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to Lunch with Books. We're trying to do this uh, as a video live stream as well, so that's why I'm seated here in front of the camera temporarily. Uh, welcome to Lunch with Books. Uh, I have asked that people wear a face mask. We have disposables up here if you did not bring one, uh, at least during the duration of the program. And obviously, if you're eating or you need to take a, a drink of something, feel free to remove it for that purpose. Uh, next Tuesday on the 7th, we're going live stream only because our guest is not comfortable uh, with the way things are. So, unfortunately, we'll not be meeting here, but we'll have the 57 servings Heinz catch-up program uh, live stream online at our usual channels. I'll send out the links in, in the email. Emily Ruby is the curator at the Senator John Hines History Center, and she wrote the book about ketchup and did the exhibit. If you've never been there, obviously their Heinz ketchup exhibit is a very impressive one. Now, on September 11th, we're just, we just announced a new program. Actually, the program will be on Friday, September 10th, here in this room at 12.30. We'll be uh, starting tomorrow installing an abstract art that was created on 9-11 2001 by an artist who was listening on the radio to the events of that day. We will have two speakers, one of whom was there at Ground Zero for the Red Cross and is now a doctor at Wheeling Hospital, and another who is a, a political science professor at Bethany. Um, Rabbi uh, Leaf will join us uh, for the blessing at the beginning of the program. So it's going to be a full day, and then you can view the, the art as well up here on the stage. That is September 10th, Friday, at 12.30. Please do not come early because there's a children's program. Uh, you can come starting at noon. Uh, I know people like to get their seats. The uh, Ruther Pollock Labor History Symposium is this Saturday, and it's part of, as is this program, the uh, centennial observation of the Battle of Blair Mountain. And uh, so we, that is the Walls Foundation, and the library are associated with the Blair 100 events. This event is being, this particular event today is being held in partnership with the Battle of Blair Mountain Centennial, which is taking place in many communities across the state over multiple days. The Centennial aims to commemorate the significance of the Battle of Blair Mountain in 1921 and the rich history of the southern West Virginia coal fields. It is also a way to memorialize the brave men and women who fought for civil rights and labor rights of minors and their families. Finally, the event is a celebration of the ideals of inclusiveness, diversity, and equity. So that is sort of the mission of Blair 100. Now I'll introduce one of our panelists and then I'll, I'll call upon one of our guests to introduce our main uh, guests for this, for this afternoon. Pat Cassidy, who's seated behind me, uh, obtained his BA in philosophy from Wheeling College and his JD law degree from the Catholic University of America. He's the president of the law firm of Cassidy, Cogan, Chappelle, and Vogelin. For more than 40 years, he has represented employees, unions, and other individuals in civil rights matters and other issues related to the workplace. So uh, he has a lot of experience in labor law and is the co founder with his wife, Mary Ellen, and president of the Wheeling Academy of Law and Science Foundation, the Walls Foundation, where I also work. Uh, so he is joining us today. And now I will introduce to you the Poet Laureate of West Virginia, who is a great friend of the library and organizes the Wheeling Poetry Series. And we have an event coming up that I will find a date for that uh, so that we can announce before we leave today. But here is Mark Harshman. Thank you, Sean. Um, I'm just going to do a brief bio on Denise and then say a few uh, personal words before we get going. Denise Giardina grew up in a coal camp in McDowell County at the very southern end of West Virginia. She's the author of six novels and one play. Her journalism has appeared in The Nation, The Village Voice, The New York Times, and The Washington Post. 
Giardina is the recipient of two fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts. Unless things have changed, you can only win three. Um, an American Book Award, the Lillian Smith Award, and Boston Book Review's Fisk Fiction Prize. These are all major uh, awards. She is a graduate of West Virginia Wesleyan College and the Virginia Theological Seminary and a deacon in the Episcopal Church. Personally, I've believed for a long time that Denise is the single greatest literary treasure we have here in Appalachia, whose presence in the nation's great literature has been uniformly praised, if not always as fully acknowledged as I think it should be. About Storming Heaven, for instance, the Cleveland Plain Dealer wrote, if we are very lucky, every few years there arrives a novel that is so moving, so instantly successful, that it towers high over much else being published. Storming Heaven is that novel. And to think that that novel was published about the southern coal mining counties of our little state is a testament to all kinds of things. About her novel, The Unquiet Earth, the Washington Post wrote simply, breathtaking, a work of great narrative force, full of anger, wisdom, and redemption, rendered with skill and authority. I can't think what else anybody would ever want to have to say about a, a work of fiction than those very words. Certainly no one has written more convincingly about the people and culture of Appalachia than has Denise in her landmark novel, Storming Heaven and the Unquiet Earth. These alone would earn her place in the canon of Appalachian letters, but that she's written a spellbinding fantasy um, and three compelling works of historical fiction concerning King Harry, Henry V, those you keep in track, Emily Bronte and Dietrich Bonhoeffer not to mention a play about Robert Byrd and Ted Kennedy, um, Robert and Ted, and for my money, the best candidate for governor we've ever seen in the state of West Virginia. Well, Denise, I'm selfishly glad you've not written poetry, or at least not much that I'm aware of. Uh, it is my honor, and I mean that word more than I've ever meant it here on this stage, it is my honor to welcome here today, Denise Tiardina, a very, very warm welcome, please. Is it okay if I stay seated? I've been coming to ask. Is it okay if I stay seated? I guess since I have a chair, I could. Um, can you understand me okay with the mask or should I take it off? Okay, sure. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'm far enough away from you. <laughs> okay. Um, well, this is so, I was, it's funny. I was packing Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening, uh, and um, to come here. And it hit me that I haven't done an in-person presentation like this for two years. Now, why? <laughs> of course, of course, we know why. Um, and and I thought, you know, it's been so long since I did something like this. What am I supposed to wear? I can't remember what I wore. And I looked at the publicity thing that, that the library sent out for this, and I saw there was a picture of me wearing a dress, and I thought. What's a dress? <laughs> I haven't worn a dress for two years, and 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 I also um, I'm a lap swimmer, and at the first um, spring of COVID, my YMCA was shut down for three months, and I couldn't swim. And like many other stories, probably blogging about the same story, you know, I gained my COVID 15 pounds, and so here I am Sunday afternoon, and I can't even fit into this dress anymore. <laughs> so I'm just to wear it. So I just thought, I'll wear what I do when I do Zoom presentations, which is just clothes. <laughs> so, so that's why I'm sitting here in clothes, uh, and um, including a t-shirt. And I uh, picked this t-shirt to wear um, because I decided it really fit into introducing the subject. Um, uh, the, uh, you probably can't read it from far out there, but the, uh, the front of it says, I speak fluent Appalachian. Which I did, and um, and the back. It, can you read the back real quick? Uh, ask Sean if he would read the back. He's already practiced, but if you want to read it, <laughs> know the Appalachian young people. You don't have to lose your accent. Flour can be flair. Oil can be one syllable. Oh, I touch you here. Oh, <laughs> oh, you 
you don't have to take it when people make fun of you talk. If you choose to change, that was a teacher, if you choose to change it, that's okay. But no, you don't have to give up that part of yourself. Oh, that's a great quote. Siles House. And Siles House is a Kentucky uh, writer who's a, a dear friend of mine. He's actually my literary executor. So when I'm dead, he's going to be taking and, care of some of him. <laughs> and he's coming here in just two, two or three months. Okay, great. So come, come listen to him. He's worth uh, coming to hear. Um, so yeah, this, you know, this is saying standing up for Appalachian uh, dialect. And the reason it's pertinent is because I wrote this novel, Stone in Heaven, about the Battle of Blair Mountain, partly, but also about the larger question of Appalachian culture and, and what it was like and what coal mining did to it. And um, and the first chapter, uh, some people have a little difficulty with it because I felt really strongly that I should capture the way people spoke before the coal industry came in, uh, and also uh, the way many people still spoke when I was a child, my, my grandparents' generation, and my generation, I hear less and less of it now, but now and then you still hear some of this, and I think it's important to capture it, not for nostalgia's sake, but for, but for the connections, but with their cultural past. So the beginning of Stormy Heaven is, uh, they is many a way to mark a baby while it is still yet in the womb. A frightened its mother, to its mother will render it nervous and fretful after it is birthed. If a cotton head strikes, a fiery red snake will be stamped on the baby's face or back. And a portentous event will violate a woman's entrails, grab a young one by the ankle, and wrench a life out of joint. And a little bit, a couple of paragraphs later, uh, the narrator uh, says, uh, he talks about the birth of his nephew, and he says, it was fast for a first young, and so and I, and I keep that hit all the way through. And there's a new movie out right now um, called The Green Knight, and uh, it's based on uh, the medieval poem Gawain and the Green Knight, uh, which is by an anonymous poet uh, who was about the time or earlier than Geoffrey Chaucer, and. Um, I read a review of it in the New Yorker last week. Uh, Anthony Lane, who is the cinema uh, uh, film critic in the New Yorker, wrote a, a nice review of it. Um, and he talked about the original poem, Gawain and the Green Knight. Uh, and he, he said, um, that, uh, and he talked about uh, how the, it affected the movie. Uh, but he quotes the poem. He says, that to tell his story, the poet says, as hit is stad and spoken in story stiff and strong. So so that was the that was the language of the 14th century hit. As hit is stad and spoken. Uh, and so hit was fast for a young man. And later on in the book, uh, one of the characters uh, makes fun of people saying hit, and, and another character says, Well, Chaucer said hit. <laughs> and so I tried to capture that in this first chapter. I knew some some readers. Uh, would have difficulty with that, and I've heard that from readers who said at the beginning I had trouble with it. Um, uh, but as it goes along, it actually gets easier, and that's on purpose because throughout the book, that kind of language, there's less and less of it. Uh, and especially in the narration, there's still characters who say that, but, uh, uh, but that type of Appalachian dialect gets less and less. So by the time you get to the end of the book, um, you have the main character uh, uh, who um, who, um, it's, this is after the Battle of Blair Mountain, and I'll talk about Blair Mountain in just a minute. Um, but at the end of the Battle of Blair Mountain, she's she's trying to get a wounded man away from the battlefield, and she gets help from two New York reporters who are there to cover this because this book, the Battle of Blair Mountain was national news. Uh, if you look at a uh, if you look at uh, the newspaper, the New York Times, for example, from August thirty first, nineteen twenty one. Uh, you will see it was the top headline at the top of the New York Times, and was for several days. Uh, so, uh, but this this character is talking to these reporters, uh, and, uh, and she says, "Who are y'all?" I asked. Press, the man said, "New York Times and the New York Tribune. Y'all ever heard of them there?" 
The woman flicked Ash with the tip of her cigarette and gave him a withering look, because he's making fun of this. And so Carrie says, that y'all's car? Y'all want to love him anytime soon? She's trying to get help to get this wounded man uh, away from the battlefield. And so they agree to help, uh, and, um, uh, and Carrie says, they told me their names, but I forgot them at once. I gave them mine, but wouldn't tell them who Rondall was. They both lived in New York. The man was originally from Baltimore. You going to tell our side, I asked. She will, the man said. She's practically a damn Bolshevik herself. The woman laughed. We aren't Bolsheviks, I said. Careful of my grammar. We're all kind of things. Well, that's true. That's just a passing phrase. But I thought, um, as this character says this, as I wrote this, um, how sad that if this is a so this is a woman who's been through what she's been through. And she's worried about the way she talks. She doesn't want to sound good. This is what this t-shirt is all about. So um just put the mask back on. <laughs> um, so um Blair Mountain really to me is so, you know, this is after 30 years from the beginning of the book, uh, and in, the, in that time the coal industry has come in has taken the land most of the land in southern West Virginia, much of it in this part of West Virginia. And it's taken um, the labor of the people, it's mistreated people, um, to the point where we had an armed rebellion a hundred years ago this month, um, which scared the authorities to death. Uh, this is a few months after the Greenwood Massacre in Tulsa, Oklahoma, which I hope you know about now because it's gotten a lot of publicity this spring. Um, and this was an armed rebellion of coal miners of all ethnicities and all races. Uh, and the authorities in Washington and elsewhere, in Charleston, were scared to death because a large number of these armed miners were also African American miners uh, who were armed. And that's why you had the U.S. Army coming in uh, and, and so forth. Um, so it was a major event that, that then got hushed up, uh, and we're finally uh, um, learning more about it. Um, and thanks to, and I'll pat myself on the back, thanks to uh, novels like Storming Heaven, um, thanks to movies like Made One, John Selfis Made One, thanks to a number of documentaries on, on West Virginia public television, which has done an incredible job, uh, and thanks to National Public Television, uh, which has recently did a, a, a documentary on the mine wars. And so we finally are learning about this, and, and I'm, I'm so pleased to see all the events that are happening around the state this month about this event. Um, but this is about people rising up uh, and people getting beaten. And because what happened after the Battle of Blair Mountain was a total collapse of the miners' union. Uh, and um, it was a time very much like their time, I think, um, uh, where labor is beaten down in a lot of ways. Uh, and and um, it's also, though, uh, hopeful to me because I look at 1921 and it's only 12 years later that Franklin Roosevelt uh, was president and made it possible for unions to organize again. Uh, and we saw a, a resurgence of the labor movement, which led to the prosperity of the 1940s and 1950s and 1960s. Uh, so history goes in cycles, and I hope, I think we're at the bottom of one of those cycles, but I hope we're going to come out of it. And I hope the purpose of studying history to me. Uh, uh, and preserving history is not for us down there, not because it's always so cute that they talk that way, or, uh, the, but that it's important to learn from the past so that we can bring it into the future and look at the hopeful things of the past and bring them into the future uh, because we still need them. So um, I don't want to say too much more because I've got these two guys sitting behind me who I'm really interested to, to have a discussion with. And, um, See what y'all want to um, bring up, discuss. So if I can listen to you talk about eight of these, and then feel like we have to shut up for the eight of the channel. I did find it curious that you mentioned a bit about dialect. I know that uh, in my first two or three children's picture books, and I wasn't trying even to talk with 
the uh, uh, native language of certain counties in West Virginia. I was simply trying to, to um, create a kind of dialect that rang true for both my Hoosier farm people that I come from, as well as just my neighbors here in West Virginia. And almost all of that dialect was stripped from those early books by my editors. Um, well, I can't actually. Um Fight to the copy editors. <laughs> I mean, um, oh, but, uh, uh, with Swarm and Kevin, uh, you know, there's a lot of still yet in that bears and, and that kind of thing. And um, uh, especially still yet, I remember. Uh, the, the copy editor uh, had gone through, and every single still yet in this whole 300 page book, uh, she had marked out the yets. So it was all just still. So I had to go back and add all the yes, so it was still yet, and to make a note saying, do not strike, you know, it's both words, still yet. In fact, we say it's still yet. It's the way we say it like one word. And I still, I still talk like that when I'm, you know, just with people. And uh, and like I said, I think it's disappearing in the younger generations, but still now and then I hear it. Still yet, I hear it now. <laughs> so, yeah, so that was, I had to always look for that too. Matt, go ahead. Well, um, my first reaction on rereading the book, I read it many years ago, um, and it was uh, just as great then. But I gotta say, I read it again recently, and um, I guess I've uh, grown up a lot since I first read it, but uh, I found it even more amazing the second time I read it. Uh, I think your mic's not. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, what I said is that I read recently Denise's book and uh, for the second time, and it, I think it meant a lot more to me recently than it did when I read it as a young man. Uh, and what struck me most vividly um, was the timeliness of it. Um, with our uh, labeling of each other in our nation and our, uh, you know, incessant putting of people into categories, uh, whether it be political categories or racial categories, and which I think is one of the fundamental problems uh, with our loss of uh, civility, uh, with our loss of uh, community. And uh, the, the part that I really love was the first organizer, Johnson. Uh, it was an African-American man who comes to organize the union. Uh, and uh, of course, he has to do it surreptitiously because uh, the union people are beat up, killed. And Johnson himself is thrown in a furnace uh, when some uh, uh, coal uh, supporters Detectives uh, find out he's unionizing. But I, I'd like to read just a little passage uh, from Denise's book about that. When uh, Johnson meets with all white miners and he says, Y'all here to ride the goat? Which was, I guess, a phrase I didn't hear that before, Denise, for. Uh, unionizing, organizing, and he says, um, but brothers, this ain't no club. We got to stay secret for a while to survive, and when we finally show ourselves, we got to stick together to live. This here is life and death. This ain't no Mason Lodge. This is the United Mine Workers. The union means brotherhood. That's something that operators can't never take away. Brother, my daddy was a slave. I know what that is. When a man got the money, a man got the land, a man got the guns, you can't beat him. No, you can't, unless you got brotherhood. When you stick together, the man can beat one down because he knows there, there's more where that one comes from, and they'll whip his ass. I got cards to sign, 35 cents dues, 
Take the pledge, sign the card, you and the union. It ain't easy. You got to be ready to die for each other. We don't want no yellow bellies in the union. You in the clan, we don't want you in the union. Union is for white and Negro alike. Union is for foreign. Union is for Catholic. Anybody want to be a free man and fight for it, union is for him. Here is the cards, boys. Take the pledge, and they are yours. Um, I can't think of a better definition of what real unionism is, uh, what real brotherhood of working people is all about, than that passage. Any thoughts on that? Any of these? Um. Did you realize it was so powerful when you were at Brian? I hope it would be. But it, you know, I feel like it didn't come from me, it came from what I read that other people said that those miners said. And, you know, I read a lot of first person uh, uh, oral, his, oral history, uh, uh, what, what we historians call primary sources, which is the actual people in their actual work. And, those are the kind of things people said, and, and I remember being struck by them. Um, you know, I participated in a couple of strikes, the massive strike and the piston strike. I was actually arrested a couple of times during the piston strike, and um, uh, and I talked to a, a, a local union official down in Logan County, who was an African American man, um, who talked about um, the, uh, you know, if you were in the Klan, you weren't, they kicked you out, if they found out you were in the union, uh, the Klan, they kicked you out of the undone. Um, so uh, that was how strong um, the UMW felt about that, and um, that always struck me. And, um, and and I do think that's one of the importance of the labor movement, which never, you know, um, the fact that, that um, labor unions have been under attack for the last 30, 40 years uh, is, has damaged our society as a whole, I think. Um, and, um, but I see hope uh, when I see some balloons, you know, it's like, um, you know, you think you've got this, somebody's plowed this field, you know, under, and uh, but then you see these little shoots of green sticking up, you know. Uh, look at the teacher strike, for example, here in West Virginia. But, you know, that was uh, very moving. <laughs> and uh, uh, so I think um, there's, there's hope. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I get... Uh, Okay. I get choked up. I actually, I, I, I had I started a couple years ago, and, uh, and ever since then I get, get choked up more. If that makes any sense. So I think we're starting to get choked up more. About Frankly, yeah. I'm just going to continue down that line, please, if you will, which maybe leaves more tears. <laughs> uh, but um, maybe it's my accumulation of years that I've become. I feel like I've become more myself more pessimistic regarding the future, and I feel as if any sort of political change is, is doomed, which leads me to kind of a twofold question. Can you point to a time, you don't have to read it, but a moment in, in one of your novels um, where one of your characters has faced a, a similar kind of hopelessness and, and, and nonetheless persevered and come through? And then the second part of that question might be, and have you felt such a thing personally, which you've already alluded to, you're seeing hope. Well, uh, the state was born in heaven. I think the main character, Carrie Bishop, um, as I alluded earlier, was has been through so much. Uh, those of you who are familiar with the book, um, uh, she's a young woman from Eastern Kentucky. Uh, she becomes a nurse. Um, she falls in love with a, a union organ activist organizer, uh, uh, but he's, he's not the Marian type, let's put it that way. But, so he goes on his way, and uh, so that she marries a preacher who becomes involved with the union movement. And, um, and he is shot and killed by mine guards uh, toward the end. And so she loses him and then meets the first uh, fellow again uh, and uh, has an affair with him. And he gets, he's, gets shot at the end uh, and, uh, and dies. And um, so here's this young woman. Uh, now she has a young child. Uh, and, uh, and and yet, she, and, and the novel kind of leaves her bereft, except you get a sense she's going to keep going. Uh, and she's going to instill her son with uh, the values that 
it will carry on what she does in a lighter novel I wrote. Um, uh, and um, and uh, just recently, uh, there was a Broadway musical. I, that's not, I shouldn't say Broadway musical, but a musical that's been written based on Storm and Gabby that was performed uh, by West Virginia Public Theater in Morgantown. And they're trying to get it to New York, uh, and then pandemic hit, so it's, everything has been on hold, and no theater. But um, uh, it ends with a kind of hopeful note uh, that music is very much like Les Miserables, those of you who've seen the musical Les Mis, of course. You know, you're standing up for things. And um, so it ends even though you know, several characters have died uh, and all that, um, there's this hope. So um, I think that's the human situation. Yeah. Good. Thanks. Uh, I'm just uh, you know, following up on uh, Carrie Bishop. To me, she's the strongest character, and I think maybe that's intentional. And I, I, I think it's also very timely. Uh, even 20 years ago, when you wrote this book, or 40, whatever it was, 87, it's been a while. Yep. <laughs> uh, but you know, that portrayal of such a strong woman. And you know who who can uh, you know the men would listen to her, and uh, she could hold her own with men. And I don't know. And she she to me she's the character that stands out in the book. Well, she actually she's a very character. Men must have been all dead. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they all three of them have been shot. So uh, uh, the three main male characters. So uh, um, yeah, she's a strong woman, and I, that's a sense I've always had of Appalachian history. And, and many cultures of history, whether it's African American history or Native American history, is that the women um, really um, hold much of it together. Um, partly because um, the men are in so much more danger of being violently shot, or whatever. Or there's always been this taboo, you know, shoot a woman, you know. You know uh, although certainly we've seen plenty of instances where that's totally ignored when you look at, for example, uh, Massacres of Native American um, tribes, where like wounded knee, where women and children were also killed, and or Lolo, Colorado, which was the cold, uh, there was a cold strike, and um, where um, the miners were and their families were living in tents, and, and the um, mine guards and the government troops came in and set them on fire, and a number of women and children were killed. So it's not that women and children were safe. Uh, but, but they were able sometimes to get away with a lot of the men couldn't. And, uh, and they were very, they were tough. Uh, can you imagine raising children in a tent in the middle of winter for a year and a half? That's what people did back then in order to have a meeting. So they were tough. I know that uh, religious faith, if not belief, has played a significant role in the lives of some of your characters, as you mentioned, you carry various creatures. Um, and there's this wonderful passage in Fallon's Secret, which we might not get to otherwise if I hadn't brought it along, um, called Thin Places. As some of you know, a Thin Place is that place where the, the divine, however you want to def define that, Bursts into the so called real world, and there's this passage. You'll forgive me, I'll read diaphanous. Uncle John said, I love that word. That's how to describe how to describe a membrane between dimensions. You could call the altar rail of a church a thin place where people kneel and meet the divine as though God stretched an invisible hand through a curtain, or the new river that's here, West Virginia, cutting its odd old way through ancient mountains. God's finger tracing a jagged path, and the thinnest of all places where the jagged crests of those old mountains touch the sky, stand on such a place, and you're close to true reality. Destroy it, and you rip a hole in the fabric of creation. I don't know if you want to say any words about that, that angle. I mean, there's a way in which there's a it gives it uh, room for hope, but also 
points of the dire consequences when we don't proceed with more wisdom. Yeah, that, that was my novel that was inspired by my um, abhorrence of mountain on the Google, and, um, which I saw as a spiritual as it's all. But um, it, it is, I, don't, I still, maybe, it depends on my mood. Sometimes I'm as pessimistic as anybody. I'm always as pessimistic as anybody. But, uh, I also often, often um, maybe this is the key to all my novels, uh, which is they all are theological novels, I think, which is, um, I really didn't know what I was going to write about until I went to seminary, and I did, I went to uh, Virginia Seminary, which is an Episcopal Seminary, and, um, um, and that's, when I, that's when I knew what I wanted to write about, is after I went to seminary. I'd always wanted to be a writer ever since I was a little kid, but I, I just didn't write because I didn't have a didn't know what to say, but once I graduated from seminary, I knew, and I started writing. And, and so, um, my mother once said to me after my, like my third book had come out, she said, "You know, every one of your novels has a preacher in it." <laughs> I'm like, "I stop looking." Well, she's right. Every single novel, all six of them, have preachers in them, uh, in one form or another, and in one variation or another. Everything from Episcopal priests to holiness preachers, and um, so. Uh, and Catholic priests and Methodist priests and it, it's, it's so they're all um, uh, connected with I guess with some of my theological understandings. One of which is that um, uh, Jesus always stood with the losers. I guess I'll put it that way. Um, if uh, if you're losing and Jesus stands with you and you become the winner and you oppress somebody else, then Jesus is going to be with them. And we're all in that position. We're all in the position of being winners and we're all in the position of being losers at some time or other. And um, you know, when we're losers, <laughs> that's when Jesus is with us. I'm not a preacher here. Uh, but uh, that's, uh, that's my theology. So. He's just following up on that same concept. Could you comment on your inspiration for naming this novel Stormy Heaven? Uh, yeah, actually, that's. Um, I was always thinking what to name my novels and often didn't make a decision until toward the end, but that, that appeared to me actually kind of um, in the middle of the night. Um, I, I, was, I, I woke up uh, one night, you know, sometimes you wake up in the middle of the night and you kind of Think or something, but then you drift back off again. And often, back when I'm writing, uh, I would keep a notebook by my bed stand for, for moments like that. And so uh, uh, I wrote, I woke up with this phrase in my mind, and, and I jotted it down. And uh, then the next morning, I looked at it, and it was storming heaven. And um, and I realized that it had been floating around in my head because uh, I was thinking of. The Battle of Blair Mountain, and thinking of these miners climbing this mountain. If you've ever seen Blair Mountain, um, it's really an imposing looking mountain down in Logan County. It's, it runs for miles and miles, and it's steep. And uh, I thought of them trying to climb that um, uh, to get to the other side. And um, um, and I also had been reading Flannery O'Connor, uh, who wrote uh, a, a novel called The, the Violent uh, Barrett Away. And um, which is a it was just, uh, from a verse in Matthew, which I can never remember chapter and verse. Uh, I think it's the eighth chapter, but uh, I can't remember. Uh, but it talks about like Jesus talks about the violent, the violent taking heaven by storm. Now, if you read different translations, it says it differently. Uh, in one of the earlier translations, it talks about Jesus says the, the violent will bury it away, it being heaven. Um, uh, and depending on the translation, it's going to read different ways. But one translation is that the Bible uh, will take heaven by storm. And I mean, what a oh, weird thing for Jesus to say in a sense. He's talking about violent people, and yet they're going to take heaven by they're attacking heaven. But somehow, the way it's phrased, it's not like, oh, they're bad people who are going to hurt heaven. It's like these are people who are by storm trying to get into heaven. <laughs> and, uh, and it just struck me as. And, and I can't remember if I was thinking that before I woke up with 
that phrase, or if it came after, or it was, I can't remember the time we had it, but, um, but it was all connected. And, um, and it was connected to me with this, these miners picking up arms, which I don't support at all. <laughs> I mean, I'm not a pacifist, but I'm pretty close. And, uh, uh, and so, um, but picking up these weapons and, and um, going after something that would be a better life for them and their families. Um, and uh, and so, so that's where it came from. That sort of opens the door for me to ask, um, a couple of ways I could ask this, but staying with that sort of religious theme, and it's, I'm not surprised to hear you say that you consider all of your novels, theological novels, in a certain sense, and you do it marvelously. I mean, I think in, in any work of literature, fiction or poetry, to, to, to carry that, how should I say this, that witness to the divine, to do that without preaching is, is a tricky thing to do. Can you think of any other authors that do a similar thing successfully, have a, have a true religious sense, however defined, in their work uh, without becoming dancing, and preaching, whatever however you want to call it. Uh, well, the first one that comes to my mind is Flannery O'Connor. Um, you know, and I think the way to do it, uh, you know, I'd have to think more about who else there might be. Um, but, um, oh, Marilyn Robinson. Uh, Marilyn Robinson, if you've ever read her Gilead novels, uh, wonderful. Same thing. And to compare that, I think, with preaching novels, it's like, you know, here's a preaching novel, you know, this character's good, and that's all these good things, and this character's awful, and they drink, and they smoke, and they cast, and they do this and that, and, uh, um, and, and the good person is so nice, and they're going to win, and they're going to praise the Lord, they're going to, you know, carry the day in hand, and, you know, yeah. if you look at my work, if you look at Flannery O'Connor's work, uh, you look at Marilyn Robinson's work, everybody in there is a flawed human being. Because that's the only kind of human being there is. And so, so, um, so there's no, uh, you know, um, I'm thinking of a character in my book, The Young Flat Earth. It's named Arthur Lee. He's, Arthur Lee is the local crooked politician, uh, works for the coal company, runs the local coal mine. Uh, just a total jerk. Um, and um, at the end of the book, uh, the coal company dam breaks. It's like the Buffalo Creek flood uh, in Logan County uh, in 1972, which many of you may remember. Um, uh, and uh, Arthur Lee is partly responsible for it, but he's also there and he you know, runs to warn people. He was one of the first people that gets hit by the flood. Um, so, <laughs> yes, yeah, we're all we're all flawed. Yes, yes, yeah. That uh, seventy-two flood, which uh, good Governor Moore from here in Japan handle said was just an act of God. Yeah, but um, but they always they always say that they but they are also all. Um, even the worst of them, even the worst of them, and I, I won't name names because I'm not getting trouble, but um, uh, even the worst of them, so you look at it, you just saw your war. It's like, who agreed? Um, and they also, I mean, they often, um, they're, you know, they're in hell, they don't even know it. And, and I don't mean that they're going to hell like when they are eternally, I mean, but they are um, suffering. Uh, and um, uh, you know when you have, um, I'm just just this week a couple of radio personalities who, who rail against the vaccine, and rail against wearing masks, uh, and died from COVID this week. And one of them at least, uh, not in a panic, still telling people not to get the vaccine. And uh, that person is. Uh, not a person to demonize, that is a person to say this is a sad 
wounded person who has done some damage and is spiritually paying for that somehow. Um, and I say that, I, 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 you know, I know a lot of people who deal with this, about um, Emily's ghost my novels about the Brontes, and they were universalists. Um, they were no hellers, they didn't, and I have a character in Song of Heaven um, named Albert Freeman, he's a preacher. He's a no heller preacher. Um, I don't believe in hell in the, in the sense of traditional belief. Like I said, going to a physical place where you're going to burn all eternity, and that's that. Uh, I believe in a hell where in this life and maybe the next life, there's a purifying fire that burns the evil out. I think that's the that. Uh, and, that um, and that we all face that at some point or other. Uh, and, um, uh, so, and that's. Uh, that's how I view my characters, and um, and I think that you see that in Flannery Connor, you see that in Marilyn Robinson. Um, Flannery Connor has this wonderful story, which is one of those famous short stories of the 20th century, A Good Man is Hard to Find, um, where this mass murderer, you know, he's, a, not mass murderer he's a murderer, and he shoots people, and, uh, and at, the end of the book, at the end of the story, this woman who's getting ready to shoot, um, so you're just like one of my babies, uh, and he shoots her, and, and he says, you know, she, uh, um, she'd have been a good woman if she had somebody to shoot her every day of her life, <laughs> you know, which is, um, and so it's like a murderer and a woman who's shot, um, who's a really obnoxious woman, by the way, um, are both human beings to somehow redeem each other. And so, long answer to your question. I want to stop here and see if do we need to take questions from the audience. Uh, do, do they want to ask questions or do, how do you all if I may ask one further. Sure. Um, I'd like for you to talk about the images in the book of the vein coal mine how in a horrible way it was to be living crawling on his belly for the dying line the wall around his father in the mind child. Where did that come from? That's from your experience, your research. Just tell people a little bit about the condition. Well, the older mind, yeah, it's from my research uh, and reading again all histories and um, uh, you know, people did they had to take their children into the mind because um, they got paid by the ton. They didn't it wasn't they didn't get paid like for a AR eight hour shift. They didn't get paid by the hour. They got paid by how much tonnage you could what you could dig, and and they also often shortchanged you. Know. So in order to, to even make close to a living wage, you had to have everybody in the family, and all the men anyway, in there digging coal and loading cars of coal, and um, that included little kids. And um, so uh, it was a horrible thing. Um, but also, you know, I've also I talked to men temporarily. Uh, to talk about the freedom of being a miner. This is people working in the 70s and 80s and 90s. Um, uh, like you don't have anybody, you know, there, it, it gets you in your blood in the sense that um, there's nobody looking over your shoulder. Uh, you know, it's just you and the rock, that face of coal. And, um, uh, and, they don't, and many of them would say, I don't want a you know, desk job or, job or something like that. I even, uh, there were people Back when coal mining was paying well, and there were plenty of jobs back in the 70s and 80s, there were school teachers who were going down in the mines because they could make more money. Uh, and um, but actually, uh, I was I worked for a congressman for a year, and he had just gotten elected, and uh, was going down in a mine. Was being one of the coal companies was taking him down inside a mine uh, to see what it was like. Um, so I said, oh, please, because I was working on Stormy Heaven, and please, can I go with you, you know, and so he said, okay, so I went down this morning uh, in Boone County, uh, and, um, and I had that experience, it was quite an experience of, you know, seeing mushrooms growing, you know, in the earth. you know, we traveled for like two miles inside this mine, and you, were, you see mushrooms, you know, and, uh, and then we would pass a, a picnic range where, with a land where they would, the miners would come and have eat their lunch sometimes, and um, uh, and um, and we watched them work in the mine phase with a continuous miner, 
And uh, when, when the guy stopped running it, we could hear this grinding sound, like like a giant grinding its teeth or something. And, and we were all like, looking like and, the, and the guy who was on the mine tour with us said, that's okay, that's what it's supposed to sound like. If it sounds different, I'll let you know, we can run, you know, that'd be cool. And, um, and also, though, I can remember on the way you know, in or out um, in this man we were in, he was pointing out, pointing out um, some cables along the pump. He said, if you touch that, you know, you, you get electrocuted. And, and he said, um, this is something that should not be allowed. So this, this was a young, young day. Um, uh, the person who was taking us off this tour. And, um, so that really stuck with me, um, the whole thing. Um, and uh, it, it, even though it was for one day, it gave me a little taste of what it was like to go in the ground. Yes. <laughs> I think everybody should be allowed to strike. Uh, I think anybody who works for somebody that's not self-employed, if, if you're working for somebody else, let's put it, I don't care what it is, um, you should be allowed to join a union and, and negotiate for your situation. Uh, and, um, and strike is one tool that you would have, should have, you know. Um, because we join a union, hopefully we have leadership that is judicious enough to know when it makes sense to strike. Um, but uh, as a principle, no, that, that's just something I grew up with, I guess. Um, that, yeah, I feel the same. I was a teacher and I was on the picket line for an earlier strike in, in 1989 because I remember I was on the picket line. Sarah was in Cheryl's arms as a baby, and I got a pink slip on the picket line. So I remember that clearly. Yes, um, I don't want to get ahead of myself. I'm speaking kind of on this subject at the labor symposium, but I just want to agree with uh, Denise. Uh, she says everyone should have a right to strike. You know, she's not being a radical here, this was traditionally the public policy of our country after Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, signed into law the National Labor Relations Act uh, back even uh, after the Depression, but even before the war. And the whole idea of that, it said that it is the public policy of the United States that every employee, every employee, would have the right to collective bargaining so that, in other words, it wasn't just them acting alone, negotiating with an employer. It was a brotherhood of employees. Uh, that, was, that was the whole purpose of the law. Unfortunately, the law has been modified and changed to special interests over the years and, you know, contributing to our lack of respect for law in general. Because the laws, some of the laws that have been set up to help people have sort of been turned on their face by politicians, uh, new laws. The point is, today, there's less than 10% of people in the private sector who are unionized. Less than 10%. In a country that claimed uh, 50, 60 years ago that it was the public policy of everyone doesn't mean everyone had to have a union, but that they would have someone speaking for them as a group. So yeah, I think um, Denise is right on, but I think we need to start looking at some of our fundamental structures in our country, uh, because going out on strike now, you put 10% of the populace even on strike, it's not going to do much in our economy. Uh, these years were named that in the year I was born. It was the uh, first book my mom gave me when I was 16 years old. I cry a lot too because I love to do so much. Um, and I don't see so much. Uh, I'm a huge fan. Uh, I feel like the main 
main character of Sorry Heaven and Man on Fire is really nature, not really even the human characters, but the nature of you. So much in describing what you see around you. And I was wondering about intentional and uh, why. Uh, yeah, definitely intentional. Um, and, and, uh, of course, and, and Sorry Heaven, there was still, I mean, when I write about Kentucky, the coal mining hadn't started yet, so I was able to write about the unspoiled Appalachia. And, um, but then uh, early on, uh, when the coal companies come in, and also the timber companies start clear cutting and all, all that, um, uh, that you know, I wanted to show that. But, but mainly in the unquiet earth, um, uh, there's a mountain, Trace Mountain, um, which is a character. Uh, to me, uh, it's just as much the you know, Trace Mountain is just as much a character as um, any other, of the other characters. And Trace Mountain, um, in the beginning, in the first part of the book, is a mountain with people living on top of it, uh, much like a mountain that when I was a child in McNeil County, uh, we had a, a Girl Scout camp um, that. My mom used to take our crew to, uh, and travel up over the top of this mountain, and then down in, down in was the, where the girls' camp camp was. Uh, but on top of that mountain, there were little farms, uh, and there were orchards. There were apple orchards and um, uh, farms with pigs and all this kind of stuff. And um, and that's that mountain doesn't exist anymore because it was being used by a coal company that wanted to call on it. And um, so that's what happens to Trace Mountain and Quiet Earth. You know, through, you know, in the middle part of the book, it's, it's been damaged, and um, uh, by the last part of the book, it has been its top has been taken off and deposited in, uh, uh, in this shale dump, uh, uh, gob piles we call them uh, back then, and uh, the water is collected behind that, and then it breaks like at Buffalo Creek and wipes out the whole farm. Uh, so, uh, so in a sense, the mountain. Gets his revenge, um, and um, so yeah, um, that mountain is a, is a to me was a person. Um, Sean, can I follow up on just that? I thought I hope I had a chance to say this. Um, the particular nature's character um, on June, I went through my diary for today. On a, June 23rd, 2009, there was a protest at the Massey Coal Company site at Marsh Fork, which is the little grade school that sat below this huge um, valley filled dam, right? Am I describing that correctly, Denise? And uh, Denise said these words that day. She said, God made these mountains. He made them first, the oldest in the Americas, and it is breaking his heart to see them destroyed. And as the abuse from the Massey supporters, that crowd grew more virulent with hinted violence, she went on to say, this afternoon we are standing in the valley of the shadow of death, in the shadow of evil. So um, your themes came together and that, your comments that day, well, I, I haven't forgotten them clearly. Um, just that um, doing this for the first time in two years makes me realize why it's so important to get this pandemic over with. Because there's nothing like gathering. Yeah, so, um, thank you. Thank you.